So uh, I'm Martin Svende, going to talk about Ethereum security. So can, can we turn this uh, volume up a little bit, please? Uh, to start off with security, it's like this big, pretty vague term. Uh, so what is it? So when we talk about security, it's easier sometimes to t think about risk. And risk is something which could potentially cause a loss. A risk, something, a possible event which would be bad. And uh, typically the risk level depends on the likelihood of that bad thing occurring and the impact if that bad thing did occur. So if we want to reduce risk, we can reduce the likelihood that the bad thing happens, or we can reduce the impact if it occurs. So if we reduce risk that way, we increase security. Common ways to do that is to separate things, isolate them, and uh, apply several layers of defense And um, some typical security concerns in the overall Ethereum ecosystem is like end user security. When you handle wallets and interact with contracts and dApps. Uh, and also for developers, how do I develop secure contracts and dApps? And on a macro scale, uh, the network security uh, overall. And these are all different security concerns. Uh, and the threats, they, they vary. Some of them are like game theoretical uh, incentivization of miners or um, zero day exploits or protocol, uh, yeah, stuff in the protocol which makes the, the, the communication between nodes lag, stuff like that. Very wide variety of threats. And I'm going to start with end users dealing with wallets. So when you deal with wallets, uh, a good model for security is to isolate them, have hot, cold, and frozen, where a hot wallet is what you use for everyday cash uh, on your everyday computer interacting with dApps or, or whatever you do with your ether. Uh, and then have a hot, cold, cold wallet, which you would more consider your bank. If you need more money in your wallet, you take some money from the bank and put it in the hot wallet. And you would naturally need the backup of the cold wallets, and that's what I call the frozen. So then you have done the reduction, you've done reduce the impact of the hot wallet compromise, you reduce the likelihood of a cold wallet compromise, and you reduce the impact in case your cold wallet burns up. And if you don't deal with wallets, maybe you're having the money on an exchange, which is perfectly fine if your money that you have accepted that you may lose. You should not store more than you, uh, have, than you can accept the risk of losing. Cold electronic wallets, uh, if you put together kind of a feature list of things that we want from a cold electronic wallet, is that it should be safe to use with untrusted devices. So if you're using an internet kiosk or your normal laptop has been compromised, we don't want that to be able to compromise your cold wallet. It should still be safe to use. And if someone should steal it, we want it to resist key extraction, typically uh, by erase on tamper, uh, also HSM, uh, a secure element. Uh, for all you tech nomads traveling the world, it's good if it's small enough to carry in your pocket so you don't have to leave it in the hotel room. There are some of these products coming up. The Legend on OS has been released. Uh, Trezor is a Bitcoin wallet. Uh, it's going, they have announced Ethereum uh, integration. Uh, USB Armory, this is the generic computer. Um, the interesting part of it is that when you plug it in, it spins up a new network interface. So you can plug it in in USB and then you can SSH into it. Uh, Orwell is an open source uh, secure computer, an attempt at a secure computer, it's completely open. Um, and moving on, frozen. So the backup, if you want to back up your cold wallet, you want to do it securely. Uh, you don't want the, the seeds or the private key to be able to to burn or, or 
get broken. You could put it in the cloud, uh, cryptographic encrypted, and only have a very hard password, uh, which may not be a good idea because you can lose your memory or get hit by a car or something. So one solution is to use something like the crypto steel and put it in a bank vault or dig it down in the backyard in the outback. Uh, or you can just maybe buy an old laptop. Uh, this is the cheaper solution. Uh, never let it touch the internet and then just print out the seeds and put it in the bank vault. You can also use the force. We have Ethereum. So there are native tools. Uh, Nick Johnson, who is going to present after me, he's done an implementation of an Ethereum vault, which is a time lock. Uh, so you can only uh, use a certain amount uh, at every predefined time period. Uh, and that, you, you do that using your hotkey. And then you also have the recovery key. And you can only use that once. And when you do use that, it destroys the vault and sends all the ether to the recovery address. So if the bad guy has got hold of your hotkey, then you just nuke the vault and get the money back. Uh, so you should store that recovery key in, the, in the, some kind of safe frozen backup. Uh, there's also the multisig contract, and you spread the trust er, across several people. So in, in the one of them, you reduce the impact, and the other, you reduce the likelihood, if you, the likelihood of all of them uh, trusted people getting compromised. And don't get hacked. Try not to get hacked on your ordinary laptop. If you're running a miner, remember that a miner is is 24-7 uh, connected to this network of potentially hostile peers. Uh, I'm guessing it's most often unsupervised, so don't put anything of value on it, including your coin base. It shouldn't be on the, on the miner. It should mine to a coin base somewhere else. Use virtual machines and firewalls. Uh, drop everything coming to your host, which you're not originating. Uh, just do a sanity check of what you expose. If you're a developer, you're probably exposing like MySQL or, or Apache or Tomcat or whatever. Uh, limit that. Right, interacting with contracts. So a verified contract, what does that mean? It means that what is deployed on the blockchain uh, there is a source code and it can be verified that the source code when compiled and deployed will correspond to that. It doesn't mean anything more than that. It doesn't mean that there is, it has been audited by a third party or anything like that. Only that the source code is available. Some things to watch out for if you're interacting with the contract and have the source code is does it use randomness in any way, shape or form? And if it does, where does that random come from? And can the source of that random be gamed? And can anyone access it before you? And in many cases they can. So some sources of random that can be used are uh, block hashes. It can be also uh, imported hashes from the Bitcoin blockchain via BTC Relay. In which case there are a number of, of other people which can see the headers before, before they actually get deployed on the Ether chain. And even if the source of the random is um, some user on Ethereum, some game operator, remember that the transaction uh, goes out and then it takes 14 seconds before it's getting included in the block. So anyone can just use that information and front run that source. So unless there are actual defined time slots for random and then acting on that random, uh, it can probably be, be, be gamed. You should also watch out for civil attacks. So a civil attack is when an attacker is using several identities. Imagine that you're sitting at a poker table playing against five other people, and what you don't know is that they're all colluding against you. They're all the same person. You should watch out for rage quitting. So if you're using some kind of service, which has several states which it moves between. If the state transition depends on someone doing their part, 
for example, the operator providing the seeds for the next round or the operator cashing out. What happens if he doesn't, if he just stops? Or is he, can he suicide the contract and just collect the bank? I move on to dApps. So dApps, I'm sure most of you know, probably all of you. Uh, HTML JavaScript pages, which have access to this Web3 API, and they can interact, interact with Ethereum. So dApps reside in the browser. Uh, could be missed or, or parity-based. And the browser has an extensive attack service because the web is broken. It's a centralized trust model based on the CA authority. And mainly the browser tries to render things not based on specification, uh, it's more like the specification tries to document what, what we have. They're, they've been specified post factum, and there's no real governing security model for how anything is handled on the web. So there are a lot of vulnerabilities and a lot of uh, possible exploits. So a DAP browser connects this broken web with your wallet. So I would recommend don't couch surf the internet with your DAP browser and verify that resources are fetched securely uh, over HTTPS. And when you're signing something in a DAP, you should verify that the recipient address does actually correspond to the contract that you intend to interact with. For building DAPs, the same applies. Use HTTPS that, yeah, certificates. SDS, strict transport security. And try not to use CDNs, uh, content delivery network, because that means that someone else is delivering code. And if someone else can execute JavaScript on your DAP, either because they can inject the traffic at, the, at where the client is sitting because you're not using HTTPS, or because they're serving the content, uh, uh, or because it's a cross-site scripting vulnerability, if they can execute JavaScript, they can do whatever they want with the DAP and they can send the payments to another address. And you should learn about web security, typically starting with OWASP top 10. Um, and there are a lot more than OWASP top 10, but that's a good start. So building contracts. Uh, Joseph Chow has mentioned a lot about this, but auditing and testing is very important. You need to learn the inner workings of uh, the VM, unfortunately. But also, it, it's pretty um, easy to do so. You can, I'd recommend you start with the VM source code of Python. It's very small, 600 lines of code. And try to have an upgrade path, and not only for the code in your contracts, potentially also for all your data. How do you move that into the next uh, version of your contract? As Joseph mentioned, check the invariants, escape patches, emergency breaks and try to make things foolproof. So, so even fools can use them and allow users to make errors. So this is from uh, one of the splitters after the hard fork. And what's highlighted here is uh, 1,493 ether, which has been successfully split into the zero address. So someone who probably wanted to split away his ETC but keep his ETH, Ether, and didn't put anything in uh, in that field. So basically it became zero, and all his Ether went up in smoke. And in total there's been about 1,800 Ether sent to the zero address via the splitter. Right, there are several vulnerabilities. Uh, Joseph's talked about most of them, and I don't have time to go into them. Uh, I'll mention some of them. So, not robust against chain reordering. Uh, that, for example, if you have a commit reveal scheme, what could happen is that you commit, and then comes the reveal phase, and then the malicious miner rolls back and starts mining a step back and uses the information that has been uh, revealed and starts a new uh, version. Uh, right, so here's a, a simple, uh, double function which tries to double the input, a u int 8, uh, and it puts it into u int 64, so it should be fine, right? But when we run the test and send in OX80, it returns zero. 
So you should learn the details of how Solidity works if you want to make secure smart contracts. There are several patterns uh, also mentioned earlier. Um, and you should also think about that private networks are not really private. Okay, they're called private networks, but th that does not mean that uh, that someone cannot come into them. Everything is sent over them, can be seen and studied. And if you're using the uh, original genesis, there might even be people who have access and can, can uh, interact and have ether on that private network. Some final notes. You should think about your risks and your exposures, okay? And your threats uh, according to what you are doing and what your, what your assets are. And the way to increase security is to minimize the likelihood and the impact, and thus minimize the risk. And to do that, you typically separate, isolate, and defend everywhere possible, and harden your environment. So and study the VM and learn Solidity, use the best practices. And if you're worried about consensus issues uh, on network attack, just run several clients in parallel. That's a big strength that we have in Ethereum, that there are so many different client versions so that one network attack, touch on wood, doesn't uh, affect the whole network at once, but only parts of the network. Try to build things that anyone can use, and not just us uh, tech geeks. Uh, there's lots of work uh, going on, which I would hope that more people get involved in. Here are a couple of discussions that are happening in, in the form of uh, Ethereum improvement protocol. Uh, there's uh, 134, a discussion about how we can prevent cross-chain replay attacks using uh, by, by changing how transactions, uh, the fields in them, that they're only valid after a particular hash. Uh, 138 concerning the bomb. Uh, 140, how we can implement throw in a cheaper way. Uh, 116, uh, where we can add a static call opcode, which would make it, you could call a contract from a contract, but that contract cannot modify the uh, state. Uh, so it would make uh, re-entrancy attacks uh, impossible. Well, they can re-enter, but they can't modify the state while re-entering. 102, uh, making it possible to do ring signatures, elliptic curve cryptography on-chain. And 101 is the one that I really like, uh, big into arithmetics, would enable, make it possible to do RSA cryptography and thus PGP verification on-chain. So, um, I urge you all to, to get involved in the ongoing discussion. Uh, that's all for me. Thank you.